we will be picking up on some of the threads out of that conversation and then also exploring a few new things as well. Uh, there's an awful lot to talk about on the topic, so I'm excited to see how this goes and where we end up, partly as well because I did miss the first one. Um, so I've just been recapping myself and really interesting conversations coming out. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, um, my name is Zoe from the Rebus community and we are delighted as always to partner with the OTN on these office hour sessions. And so now I'll hand you over to Karen to introduce our speakers for the day. Thanks Zoe. My name is Karen Lawrenson. I'm a managing director with the Open Textbook Network and like the Rebus team, we are delighted to partner on these monthly office hour sessions when we talk informally about issues related to open textbook publishing. As a reminder, these conversations are really community driven. And so if there are topics that you would like to cover in the future, things that you think of, um, please let us know either in the chat or drop us a note in the future. Um, today, our guests are going to share details about working within their campus system, state and regional context to develop OER policy. Today, we're going to um, hear about their experiences developing publishing policy, rolling out institutional OER policy via training, developing institutional goals to support open pedagogy, and pushing back against the collection and use of personal data along with other topics that will emerge. We have three guests today. Um, Billy and Jessica are returning from the July session and then Michelle is new to join us. And then I'm sure there's many people who are in this call who can also share their experiences. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, give a, a brief bio uh, of our three guests and then turn it over to them. Our format here today is as always um, brief and informal. Our three guests will share three to five minutes about their experience and then we're gonna open it up to all of you to drive the conversation with your, your questions and comments. So joining us today are Billy Meinke. He's the Open Educational Resources Technologist at Outreach College in the Dean's Office at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We also have Jessica Norman. She's the e-learning librarian and library liaison in construction, hospitality, and tourism at Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. And then we have Michelle Braley, who's Digital Initiatives Projects Librarian at the University of Alberta. We're going to start with Billy, so I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Billy Meinke Lau, um, and I am the uh, OER technologist for the Outreach College at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, so, um, so I just kind of give my, give my spiel right now about open policy. Okay, great. So um, a lot of my work has to do with building textbooks with faculty. Um, and supporting technology that allows that and uh, looking at processes that support that. Um, but what has come into play inevitably is policy. Um, and so sort of at two levels, um, I've had to work um, with policy um, at sort of the institutional level. Um, when I dug in and started to look at um, the existing textbooks that faculty were using and sort of the shift towards inclusive access, um, and textbook rentals, um, I found some problematic things um, having to do with the terms of service and the privacy policies associated with textbook rentals and, and the like. Um, and so um, I did quite a bit of digging and I've worked with council and I've worked with other policymakers to figure out what to do with this. Um, essentially, uh, at, the, at the first stage where we are giving students more of a heads up in terms of what types of data collection, personal information is collected by publishers when they do click through uh, the terms of service when they open their digital rentals. Um, and sort of the next step will be sort of uh, working with publishers to bring their terms of service and privacy policies in line, um, because at the end of the day, um, data collection and sort of um, extracting information about our students about how they learn doesn't really have anything to do with their learning and sort of separating that and the business models associated with that um, from the learning itself and from the classroom experience is, it's been really important. Um, on, at a state level um, here in Hawaii, um, things have been interesting. Uh, last year, we had a surprise OER bill hit the state legislature and um, nobody saw it coming um, and it was more or less the result of our student government uh, speaking with senators about what they really care about and textbook support textbook affordability was uh, one of the main items and so we had a bill that we sort of had to 
uh, watched carefully as it made it through the legislature. Um, that, that bill not uh, knocking it through. Um, fell out of set. Um, it, um, we're not quite sure how it all happened, um, but I can drop a link in to the chat if you'd like to read more about that. Um, but the good news is that we have two fresh OER bills that were just introduced at the state legislature uh, last week. And so um, both the House and the Senate at the Hawaii State Legislature are interested in supporting OER, which is wonderful. Um, and after sort of what happened last year, um, both chambers are now more or less in line in terms of knowing better how to support OER. But both bills um, at this point, um, they haven't you know, accepted testimony or anything significant yet, um, but both bills are calling for a task force or a council to be set up um, to assess the needs system-wide, statewide, um, here in Hawaii for OER. Um, the University of Hawaii is the, the state university. There are 10 campuses. I'm at the flagship campus. Um, and this, the state legislation basically is to do a survey and say, you know, if we want to do OER system-wide, um, how do we go about doing that? What's it going to cost? Who has to be involved? Like, what, what's the nitty-gritty of getting this done? Um, and so having support um, sort of at the top-down level is really nice. Um, and it's giving us an opportunity to interact with legislators and sort of open conversations about you know, how they can support the university in a broader way um, and how we are as a part of that. Um, and so um, I will drop in links to the two measures if anybody's interested in actually getting in and taking a look. The first one is our House bill. And the second one is the Senate bill. Um, and if you look at the first link that I dropped in, um, there is a link from there to Sparks Open Education Policy uh, Playbook. And inside that playbook, they make a few recommendations as to, at the state level, what, what states might adopt in terms of legislation that will support OER. Um, and one of the key pieces is setting up a task force, and uh, another one is a grant program. And so there's a possibility of that at this time. Um, in terms of the two bills and the, the similarities and differences, both are both they're calling for a task force and sort of assessment of what it would take to do OER um, across the entire state. Um, the Senate bill is more specific in terms of um, specifying who's going to be on that task force, and they've asked for the vice chancellors of academic affairs um, from each campus, which is pretty hard to pull together. Um, they, didn't, they did not yet add the or designee um, to the end of it, which would be really nice. Um, uh, so they specified who they want to be in the task force, but they actually have not included on that task force um, information technology IT people. They have not included um, a student voice. They have not included accessibility or disabilities, um, you know, uh, that sort of expertise on the task force. We may be asking for that at a later point. Um, but at any rate, sort of at the institutional level, helping students make better decisions and helping faculty be more aware of data collection with regard to the kinds of textbooks that they may have been using that they may be moving away from that's one part of it and then at the state level on the policy front um, looking at uh, uh, the attention that the legislators are putting on OER as it approaches uh, textbook affordability um, and helping make sure that um, it's uh, legislation that goes through is actually useful it's actionable it's something that we can work with and something that other states um, jurisdictions might be able to model great so, um, I will pass it along. Super. Um, Jessica, I'm going to turn things over to you if you want to unmute and turn your camera on in case it's off. There you are. We see you. Sure. So um, hopefully the sound is okay. Excellent. So um, as she said, my name is Jessica Norman and I'm at the SAIT, otherwise known as Southern Alberta Institute of Technology in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, we're a two-year polytechnic applied education institution with approximately 11,000 students enrolled, if that gives you a sense of our size. Um, I'm currently the e-learning librarian here in our library, and OER is part of my position description, so it's an explicit part of my job. Um, so when I was here in July, uh, the discussion was around a newly adopted institutional policy. So in May of 2018, our Board of Governors approved an institutional OER policy here on campus. 
it clearly stated that our institution promoted the use of OER, which was a real change from previous culture. It specified the type of open license that was preferred, clarified some of the other um, procedures around adopting, uh, adapting, and creating OER, and also clarified training and support measures. So that was really big for us. Um, since then, in the academic year, we've really seen a transition on our campus from what is OER to how do we do this effectively? So the policy was really instrumental, at least for us, to raise awareness with not only our faculty, but also our, um, our academic chairs and administrators and even <coughs> with our students. And um, it really shifted our culture to an answer of yes, when administrators or faculty were thinking about new curriculum projects or developing content, that OER was an option. Um, what that means in a practical sense is we've seen an explosion of OER activity on campus. We had um, 13 small scale projects for adoption or adaption this fall and another five course textbook replacement projects where the course went fully OER for all materials. Um, one of the projects that we, I worked on over summer and then fall was to replace the traditional textbook in 88 sections of our communication courses. Uh, so that was an immediate impact on 2,300 students this fall semester. And we're following that up with an assessment project on student perception and the use of materials. And we've got approval to share the results from that afterwards. Um, and then from a student perspective, we saw our first student association campaign to really educate and promote to the students the value of OER. It uh, riled some people up on campus. It got some interesting rumors going, um, but it also really opened up some conversations too with faculty that we may not have seen otherwise. So, but the other interesting thing about all this activity, at least from my perspective, is that there was finally an acknowledgement on campus that for OER to be sustainable in the future, it can't be a one woman show. <laughs> so I'm the only person on campus with OER in my title or in my description on campus. And I've spent a lot of time this fall talking to folks about how all aspects of our program, so advocacy, training, project management, content creation, assessment, renewal projects, how we can integrate those into institutional practices and other uh, departments on campus. And one of my main projects starting this fall is the development of a strategic plan for campus so that we can document how uh, we as an institution are gonna support these move, uh, activities going forward um, and that we can kind of distribute out the workload and, and the, the time required to, to make this successful. Um, it looks like that I'll be able to have those uh, approved by March of this year and be able to, to really put that out there and start promoting those um, activities on campus and also outside of campus with folks to help them better understand what we need to do to make this a really comprehensive program. So um, one of the first examples is simply going to be that we need to have a training program that um, will allow faculty and staff to have access to information on a scalable platform. And it's not just me giving workshops because <laughs> there comes a limit to how many you know, places I can be at once. So that and several other areas that we're gonna be focusing on will hopefully set a foundation where we'll have a long-term successful development project here at SAIT. So that's what we've been doing. Thanks, Jessica. I'm sure there's several people out there who can identify with the idea of it needing to move beyond a one person show. Sometimes you get caught by your own success. <laughs> Thank you. I would now like to turn things over to Michelle. Hi, can you hear me okay? Hi. Yes, we can hear and see you. Oh, perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me here, and thank you, Jessica and Billy, for sharing your experiences first. Um, so I'm at the University of Alberta, Canada. So to give you an idea of the size, this is a large institution. So there's six campuses, 40,000 students. 
So practices and policies are often at a department level and it gets quite complex. Um, so I don't have really an institutional wide policy to speak to, but what I thought I could speak to is some of our library publishing practices um, and how policy kind of fits within that. Uh, so specifically my role is on the library publishing and digital production team in the library. Um, and on campus, we also have an existing OER awards program, which is a partnership between the library and the Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, so through these funded projects, we started to see some needs emerge for OER publishing infrastructure. Um, and that's something, a program we've been working to pilot and build on our campus. Um, so working alongside that pilot project, um, the portfolio I'm in also is a strong existing open journal publishing program. Um, so we've been working on building our open publishing program, mirroring those existing practices that are already working as best that we can. Um, so as well as working on things, you know, like practical things like technology, planning, um, workflows, all that practical stuff, we've also been developing a memorandum of understanding, so an MOU. Really, it's just a document that outlines the responsibilities of each partner. So we kind of, um, so us, the content creator, know each other's responsibilities, and it creates an effective partnership. So where the MOU is within our service is content creators required to the MOU before um, access to our publishing tools. Um, so the kinds of things that are included in the MOU, so some of our responsibilities are things like um, providing access to press books um, and establishing a unique, a unique account, allowing them to con um, transfer content to our servers. Um, we will be updating the software, um, provide free OER hosting, of course, um, assigning the OIs, assisting with disability along with and it allows for discontinuation of the services with six months notice. Um, for the content creators, they're required to, of course, make their content freely, openly available with the CC license that allows her to create derivatives. Um, they must be fully responsible for all um, aspects of creation and transfer and updating their OER content. Um, they must provide us with contact for one designated contact for their, their project. And they're responsible for obtaining any third party permissions or seeking any copyright support that's required. Um, and of course, they're also able to discontinue the service um, with notice as well. So policy kind of fits within the defining our role within the libraries um, and how we're supporting OER on our campus. Um, just speaking from what Jess had mentioned, kind of allow for a shift from those one off workshops all the time of going in and doing the OER show to being able to kind of have a defined um, bubble for the services we can provide and where we kind of fit within the OER spectrum on our campus. Thank you, Michelle. And if you have examples of the MOU or some of the other resources you were discussing, I'm sure people on the call would really appreciate those links. Okay, now is when we put it to all of you to um, engage with our guests and ask questions about what they've shared so far or add your own stories. So um, feel free to do that in the chat or to unmute. I think we're doing okay with our um, audio and thank you for um, turning off your cameras. I think that really helps with um, what we're all trying to do here in this big group together. So, um, I have not been monitoring the chat perhaps as closely as others. So let me know, are there questions outstanding that we should start with here? We did have one in the chat uh, that came while Jessica was speaking from Kathy asking whether you have provided financial incentive for those projects that you were talking about that have uh, been kicking off and at great speed on your projects on your campus. So that is a good question. Um, the answer to that would be that no, we currently do not have a separate funding process or, or mini grant process for OER. Um, at our particular institution, the way that, the, that we're currently looking at it is that OER is built into the ongoing curriculum development processes that already exist. Um, 
the institution felt like their first step was simply to encourage folks to use OER while they're developing new materials for classes and they'll support that work. So if they get a contract to do a new course development and they develop OER as part of that, then obviously they're being compensated. But at this stage, at least, they aren't having a separate grant just for OER development. It is part of our strategic plan. So we're looking at it as a phase two, um, but right now they're focusing more on existing processes and existing funding and then just the big thing for us is putting the word OER into current grants. So um, we have curriculum development processes. We have a um, we have an in-house grant that's really kind of interesting. It's called a Cisco e-learning grant. We offer up to five a semester or five a year. It's a twenty thousand dollar development grant plus a full semester of offload time. And OER is now allowed to be one of the possibilities for that. So. I'm trying to be creative with current funding models rather than um, getting new funding that we can apply. Thanks, Matt. that sounds like a great approach working with what's already there. Um, Jessica, just to follow up on something you said in your intro, you mentioned that um, there is a preferred license. There's some, some language around that. Can you talk a little bit about the preferred licenses at your institution? Uh, sure. So um, one thing that I should definitely highlight is that being at a two-year polytechnic, we have a different um, model for uh, IP or for intellectual property than maybe at a four-year university in that our current um, our current policies and our contract, faculty contract with our um, with our institution state that all work that's developed during your employment is owned by the institution and not by the faculty member. So if we do create content during curriculum development or other activities that relate to class, the uh, material itself and therefore the license is held by the institution and not by the instructor. The reason why that's significant for us is because Historically, that meant then that the institution or its designee, so uh, someone in our curriculum development group or maybe a dean, would declare this is copyrighted and we can't or won't share it. The policy then for us in the fall or last year was really significant because it meant that our institution had a declared statement that said the default would be open and not traditional copyright. And therefore, the designee, uh, the curriculum development person or the dean was allowed to then say, yes, we will license this through Creative Commons and yes, we can make it available. So the language we use right now says that in consultation with their dean or other designee, the faculty member will apply the appropriate Creative Commons license. We as an institution have said that we um, we promote the use of CCBY unless there is some outstanding reason not to. So we're not going to say it has to be um, a completely open license. There might be a few instances why we need it to be non-commercial or something, but we have it clearly stated that, that we want it to be CCBY unless there's a compelling reason. And then there's a nice statement that says they should consult with me if they're not sure what to do and I will help them choose the most open uh, possible license. Nice. Billy, there's a question for you in the chat from Rob who's asking about some of the benefits and challenges of getting legislature involved with OER. That's a great question. So, uh, as I mentioned, last year's OER bill at the state level, uh, it was a surprise. Nobody saw it coming. Um, and um, at first glance, uh, people were, some people were saying, well, do we need a bill to, to make OER work here? Um, and sort of that was the question we were grappling with this whole time. Like, is it going to help or hinder our progress with OER? Um, and sort of as the OER bill, as the waves of, of uh, news sort of spread out across the entire state, a lot of people were like, what's OER? This is, you know, this is new. This, what are you guys doing? And a lot more people became involved and interested in it. Um, and so for that reason, it was good to have something, um, even just a proposed bill out there for OER. 
Um, but still the question that we're, we're struggling with is, do we need an OER bill at the state level to make OER work here? Um, and I'm leaning towards yes. Um, and mainly it's because, um, because University of Hawaii is a state school. Um, we're funded um, largely through the state. Um, we have reporting duties to the state for this funding that they give us. Um, and so there's a higher level of accountability. And this isn't to say that the state is gonna give us funding directly for OER, um, but there is some oversight over the university's activities with the state and we need to improve that relationship if we can. Um, so that said, um, I think setting up a formal task force, um, which is a part of the, both bills that are on the docket this year, um, I think that's a good thing. And I think it will sort of, again, raise the accountability level and get more folks sort of at the administration level involved and aware and sort of having them help move their resources, um, people resources too, around to make sure that we have a report, we have a plan, we have a better idea at the system level. Um, because of my work, primarily is focused on my campus. But like I said, we have 10 campuses and um, OER expertise and OER leadership at each campus is a little bit different. And so if we're working at the system level, um, top down, um, and if we can have the grassroots and sort of bottom up support where they meet in the middle, I think that's the sweet spot. Um, so they can they can look up or over, if you will, and say, okay, well, we have support from um, legislators and they can look over to the side and say, oh, our peers are really interested in this too. And where they meet, I think that's where we're gonna see the most blossoming, most blooming, the most really interesting work. Um, but having that accountability and the support, maybe some funding down the line from the state, that'd be really neat. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still sort of a toss up and not everybody's in agreement over whether or not we need an OER bill for this to work. Um, I know, Personally, a few folks I work with, they, they don't think that we need a bill at all, and they'd rather just see kind of, you know, uh, move on and, and not get passed. Um, but at any rate, just having a bill, having policy at a high level um, around OER really just brought it to the forefront of everyone's mind. And now they're more, they're more closely associating OER with online learning as opposed to OER being sort of this amorphous abstract thing that's on its own. Now it's like, oh, well, you can do online learning how you would like to do anyways, and just have the content be open. Um, and it's a lot of what you want to do um, anyway. But yeah, I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Billy. Um, in the chat, there's a continuation, I think, Jessica, on your comments about licenses. So Alexis is asking, if a professor doesn't want others profiting from their work, would that be considered a valid reason to make something NC, for example? Um, do you see that as taking away academic freedom if the answer is no? Have you ran into any sort of case studies like that yet? That's a, a really interesting question. Um, I just saw that in the chat. Give me a second. I'm reading through that twice. Sure. Uh, let's see. Profiting off the work of valid reason to make something an NC license. Oh, I see. So, and I have to give full props here to Cable Green, Creative Commons, and, and the rest of that crew, because I took the uh, Creative Commons certificate this past summer. And one of the things that I learned there is that NC doesn't mean what you think it means necessarily. Um, and so I've actually spent a decent amount of time on our campus trying to clarify for folks why we want to be as open as possible how labeling something as NC can really sometimes cause issues with um, using current material as well as sharing it back out because when you start applying an NC SA license that share alike element can sometimes cause some issues in ways that people don't expect. I've also at least on our campus had a, several conversations um, around what it means to be non-commercial in terms of creating copies and providing students access to print and things like that. Um, we actually did a, a small revision to our policy. It was officially approved in May with a statement that said that our institution would not print copies for students because uh, some of the um, uh, some of the, the legal information they had previously was that somehow that would violate an NC and they didn't want to go near it. And luckily, I got some information through Creative Commons. In fact, it may have been an email from Cable, um, along with some of the new uh, outcomes from some of the uh, court cases. And we were able to have our copyright officer write a statement in support of printing and providing access to the students in print. 
and we got a uh, a legal brief basically that officially said yes we can we can do this this is still acceptable under nc and so we were able to have them revise our policy and, and open that part up um and have it republished under the new language that says we can print things and that uh, NC doesn't eliminate that option through say an X, a Xerox center or something. Um, so I can't really answer the question of taking away academic freedom or not. I, I'm not sure I feel comfortable doing that off the you know, top of my head right now. What I would say though is that it's really important to understand clearly what non-commercial really means and that by locking things down under non-commercial, I found that it actually has a much bigger impact than you would you would originally uh, think of. Thanks, Jessica. And I invite anyone else to chime in um, if they would like to. I've I've also had similar conversations lately about NC with Cable, so um, I'm sure this is a big part of your life, Cable. Um, <clears throat> I'm pausing to see if anyone would like to unmute and speak up. Um, I can speak a little bit to the licenses. So um, I used to work at Creative Commons with Cable. And so um, I, I just want to reemphasize the point that the licenses are the linchpin of why this is all working, why OER is so impactful. Um, and so uh, the NC license debate and sort of the, the case law um, some of which is still being mulled over. Um, it's very, very important. Um, you shouldn't be afraid of copyright. Um, not every campus, not every institution has a copyright librarian or a copyright specialist. We don't at our institution. Um, I'm not sure if we do throughout our entire system. But fortunately, um, the CC licenses are easy enough to understand. Um, and when folks do have complex questions, there is a community to reach out to to get those those questions answered. They usually come a little disclaimer like this is not legal advice and I am not your lawyer, but that's just what they have to do to protect themselves, which is great. Um, uh, just to sort of uh, finish that thought. So we do an OER grant program at uh, UH Manoa as well. Um, and there are OER grant programs that are happening at the community college level as well. Um, and we do prefer CC BY as uh, you know what the license that, that the folks put on the list on the uh, on the outputs of their grant, um, but we do allow other licenses is if there is justification. Um, in one, possibly two cases, we did allow um, NC licenses when there was um, you know was content being developed and hadn't previously been OER, but they're making a new version of it and they wanted to make it OER, and so we funded them to do that. Um, and they did choose an NC license because there was um, some pressure from a publisher that was considering sort of borrowing in big ways from the work. And they wanted to sort of like put that on hold until they sort of uh, solidified their position and made sure everything's all good to go. Um, and they're looking at later, at a later point, um, licensing with a more free and more open license. Um, but they're sort of doing a, a more sort of uh, tempered approach in the beginning with an NC license with plans later on to, to revisit that conversation and to, to license it more openly. And I wonder if Michelle, you want to jump in. I think you mentioned that you're allowing licenses, any of the CC licenses apart from ND. And so I wonder if you could talk maybe about how you came to that position and I, I was thinking from what Billy mentioned as well about who's involved in the shaping of these policies. Was that done with consultation with faculty or, or with others within the library system? How do you kind of get to, to that within your, uh, your arrangements at the moment? Um, so we're fortunate on our campus that we do have a copyright librarian. Um, while building our memorandum of understanding, we're very closely with the copyright office copyright librarian. Um, our copyright librarian involved in uh, our OER like communities knowledge um, of the community. Um, we were also looking at our of understanding we were already using for our OS program for the open journal publishing um, and really just adapting that as possible to fit with OER. Um, so giving them the freedom to to you know, select an appropriate license, but of course, to, to be a, an OER, it, in my opinion, has to not have that ND um, license. So um, the understanding that with each project, 
um, there will be some consultation to determine what, you know, to, to educate and determine the, the most appropriate licenses. Does that answer your question? Perfect. It does, thank you. And I think we've had another one from Kathy in the chat, and I'm not sure if this is uh, targeted at anyone in particular, but she's asking, to what extent do you expect your creators, grant recipients, et cetera, to participate in subsequent OER advocacy? Do you request it formally or informally? And then for you, Michelle, do you include it in the MOU? Anyone want to jump in on that one? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. So I will say that we've had a little bit of a challenge in terms of uh, turning our OER grant recipients into OER champions. And that's not because they're not enthusiastic, it's because they have very little time. So we're an R1 research institution and these faculty, um, our grants are up to $5,000 um, to adapt or create a new OER textbook. Um, and in comparison to the other research grants that our faculty might be working under, that's kind of a drop in the bucket. Um, they have lots of duties, they have teaching responsibilities, they have to be publishing and this, this, that, and the other thing. So what we did was um, build into the grants um, that they would be blogging about their experience. And that's a way to sort of like um, put a marker um, and sort of document their experience. And even if they're not necessarily gonna be the ones walking down the hallway talking to all their uh, companions about who we are, we, could, we at least have something to point back to. Um, and initially, I wanted to have all the faculty who received the OER grants um, blog on our oer.hawaii.edu site. Um, and I realized that, that they don't always want to do that. Sometimes they want to have more ownership over it, and that's totally cool. I'm, I'm a huge fan of domain of one's own and, and those sorts of things, owning your own web space. Um, and so in some cases, we've had faculty that deferred to um, blogging on like the math department blog. And then we can just link to it. That's great. Um, and you know, we asked that they openly license that as well so I can like scrape a copy and keep it in case that ever goes away, um, that sort of thing. But um, allowing people to be champions and, and support others in the department in their own way, as long as, you know, it, it does sort of fit in the, the greater vision of having more people um, involve openness into their practice and have OER be something they regularly work with, even if they're not getting grant funding right away or at that point, um, that, that's sort of been our approach. I can jump in as well. Um, so for our OER awards program, um, it is part of that program that they're required to share about their work. So in, um, so not as strong as advocacy, but just be open to, to sharing about their experiences with those projects. Um, and um, as part of our OER publishing program, we don't have anything formally established in that regards yet. Um, but we do have a strong um, relationship on our campus with our students' union. So they've been actually the strongest advocate to pull in those faculty who are involved with OER projects um, and getting them to share their experiences um, with students' union planned events. So that's kind of how it's um, fit in with um, the OER creation and advocacy. Um, our, actually, our OER advocacy committee is actually chaired by our students union um, and they actually recruit um, members across campus who are involved with OER. So, I'm not sure if this is up and running, but um, I could share from our perspective what we're doing, um, kind of like Billy said, we don't want to formally uh, set the requirements for advocacy because it can look different to different people. We're also very aware of the time commitments. I'm at a teaching institution where our faculty are typically coming from a non-traditional background. So they've been practicing in their profession, their plumbers, their welders, their bakers who are coming to teach. And so interesting enough, what I find is I have a lot of enthusiastic folks who are adopting or creating content, but when I ask if they're interested in um, being more of an advocate or speaking publicly, I often find they run into a lot of uh, concerns about um, their expertise and, and I have to spend time kind of reassuring them from a perspective that 
well, from imposter, the, the whole concept of being an imposter syndrome, right? That they're saying to me, well, I'm not good enough at it yet, or, or I'm just wrote a, I just wrote a, a, a video. I'm, I'm not really, you know, wanting to talk about it from a, a, a larger theoretical. So what we've done is we've um, gotten permission from folks to either record them talking about concepts so that they can feel comfortable with the content, prep their conversation, maybe even if we need to edit the responses so that they're okay with that. Um, we're also asking them not to blog necessarily, but to have to either create a reflection piece or in some cases we interview them and then write up the results from the interview. And then I can use that content to craft um, posters that we can use around campus with their image or we can use the video clips during um, events and presentations. And we find that people are more comfortable doing that kind of work than being live in front of a group and talking about the process or um, or having to find time outside of a, a class teaching schedule to come to an event. So those kind of activities have worked a little better for us. Thank you all for sharing your comments. Cable is pointing to Jonathan. Um, Jonathan Poritz, if you're willing to share what Colorado is doing regarding the Open Education Statewide Council and how they're working with their state legislature, that it could be useful um, since Hawaii is considering the statewide council too. Can you hear me? No. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, great. Oh, there we go. Um, so um, yeah, so the the we uh, so what sort of what Billy describes is kind of interesting to me that it kind of came out of the blue. I guess it came a little bit out of the blue in Colorado as well. The a committee of the state legislature got interested, and apparently it was a a legislative aide who told the the legislators, "Hey, don't just jump into creating a program." do a little study first. And so the, the first bill they passed, which had a tiny budget, just got a bunch of people from around the state to sit on a council and make a proposal. We proposed a grant program and an ongoing council to help coordinate efforts in the state. And now we got into that, the legislature like that and, and jumped on that. And so we are now in our first year, we gave out grants of about a half a million dollars and supposedly we'll have another million dollars in year two and another in year three. I mean, we're trying to organize activities. I think, um, you know, we haven't had as much student input as um, some people have said. Uh, I don't really know why, but we, 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 surveyed, we did a survey um, and a student, there was a lot of student involvement in our survey. The, the state effort, the council is very active and I think we were meeting a huge amount of interest. And I think, I really feel like there's a sort of, um, is a critical threshold. Once you cross it and it becomes on people's radar, um, everyone starts talking about it and everywhere you go. You know, I, I can't walk across my campus without faculty members stopping me and saying, hey, I've got this idea, could you help me? I mean, it, literally, every, like, I just, people see me and they stop me. I, I, I think of wearing a disguise when I leave my building. Um, uh, but it's, um, the state is, I think state efforts can be nice. It's nice to have some money I think as, as one of the previous speakers was talking about, and we all have a lot of demands on our time and the amount of money that typically is available for um, OER stipends or, uh, you know, kind of some kind of little bit of funding, honorary almost, of funding to induce people to be involved in OER. Project. It's really, it doesn't, it's not a, a minimum wage job if you do the computation of how much time you spend. So my feeling is that the money is nice but what really matters is a community and a support structure. If, if there are OER librarians or if there are people in the community that know that can, um, that can answer questions and do some of the work. You know, I, I have colleagues who say, I'm not, I'm not gonna spend the time. And I say, listen, I will come to your office. Uh, you will give me the content. I will type it in to press books. I will do it all for you. Just use it when I'm done. And they say, well, okay. So I think if if you if if I were redesigning things, I might give less money as as uh, direct grants to people in the project and provide more 
a well supported this uh, infrastructure. Anyway, I don't know. I think I think I think um, it's good to good to move forward, and I, I think um, it's uh, it's nice to have support from the politicians. Um, our our governor. We have a new governor in Colorado who was one of the co-authors of the United States federal appropriation that was spent to, that funded the Libra text thing. So we're hoping that we'll get, I still haven't a chance to meet him, but I supposedly we will have more input from the governor's office. Anyway, thank you. Thanks Gable for this suggestion and thanks Jonathan for hopping on and um, sharing your story. Kathy has a question in the chat. In any of your policies, do you include having the cost of textbooks stated clearly in this registration system? Or is this more an institutional decision and not part of legislation where students are working on it now at UConn, University of Connecticut? So I put that to anyone who's here. Um, so I'll just say, um, so our uh, librarians at a number of campuses did a lot of work to um, sort of at their own campuses standardize a way that zero textbook cost courses were marked in banner, which is our system for course registrations. Um, and so they worked on that for a year and a half, even two years, we talked about it for a while, um, but there was no sort of like system level change that would, that would make that possible. Um, and part of that had to do with uh, the folks at the top in IT, um, just not being able to do it right away, not having the bandwidth to do it. And part of it had to do with um, some pushback from faculty. Um, when you have the same courses taught at different or taught by different instructors, um, and one of them maybe is using OER or a free textbook, um, that presents sort of some tension there. Um, tension also exists when you have the same course, one OER and one not, but it's taught at two different campuses because that can pull students from one to the other. Um, we have a lot of students who take courses online, a lot of students who commute between campuses. They take, they take courses when it fits their schedule. Um, and so there were some obvious like, real reasons why folks did not necessarily want to have um, the cost of textbooks marked immediately. Obviously, um, we, we thought it was a good idea. It's part of the Sparks Open Education Policy uh, Playbook. Um, and so just um, back in November, December, um, our ITS, uh, system level and a few librarians got together and they made uh, like a, a drop down menu inside of banner. So when courses are entered into the system, it makes it very easy to just select a marker and say this, you know, this is zero textbook cost course, a Democrat uh, ZTC. Um, uh, but at the same time, because there are folks that were already using the comment section and using a somewhat standardized marker that way to, to mark zero textbook cost courses, and the question came up of, okay, cool. So we're gonna be doing this, but each campus, um, they can do one way or the other or both, which one do we choose? And so we're still sort of having conversation about that. Um, my thing is about giving students the most information um, as possible to help them make an informed decision about you know, which courses they take. Um, and it may be that you know, they, they know the next semester, the prof is gonna teach this course is gonna use an OER book. And so they may wanna delay or they may wanna take the course now. They may wanna do things a little bit differently. Um, but they need to make an informed decision and having the textbook costs um, or a zero textbook cost marker on the course um, at the time of registration is, is huge. And so if you're at all able to do that, I highly, highly encourage it. Even if you come up against some, some bumps in the road in terms of how that is implemented um, and how, it, how it's done. So um, this is Anita Wells. Um, I wanted to jump in and say that Virginia had legislation last year that was passed about OER and, uh, and low cost commercially published um, course materials, which is something that was um, added by lobbyists in the first subcommittee and never taken out. Um, and that there is another bill that is working its way through our general assembly, which has has uh, to do with course markings. Um, so I'm curious to know if other folks have had um, experiences where they think it's valuable to mark OER instead of low cost or no cost, and then how are you defining low cost? Um, because that's um, pretty ambiguous. <laughs> um, I, I think it's unfortunate that it's in our law because um, it is really ambiguous and um, 
I'm just wondering if anyone has the silver lining on that, please. Uh, so I'll just say, um, so our administrators, their, their idea is that OER is one item underneath a larger textbook affordability umbrella, if you will. Um, and that is not necessarily how I think of it, but that's how they think of it. Um, so uh, we have ZTC marking happening right now. Uh, we don't have a low cost marking. I've heard, I don't wanna quote anybody, but I've heard numbers of $30 per course or $40 per course being like a reasonable number to call it low cost. And in some cases, moving away from a $150 textbook to a $30 book or set of materials is, is huge. That's a big difference. It's a, sort of a big uh, margin you're, you're gaining there. Um, but at this time, I don't see the value in, in doing that. I think that just sticking to ZTC or OER more specifically, if you can, is, is a better route to go. Uh, this is Mark. I'm uh, from New York State. I'm part of the State University of New York, New York system, SUNY system. Um, I know one of the uh, discussion points earlier was about uh, state legislators and, you know, our state um, made a significant investment in OER uh, two years in a row, and it looks like they're going to make a third year of investment, um, which has really kind of uh, brought OER into, you know, full light here within the SUNY and in the CUNY system. And we are really fortunate and, and, and trust us, we know how fortunate we are. Um, you know, but um, the, the one question that, um, that keeps coming up is about OER policies. And even though our state legislature has put money on the table, there has really been no discussion about policies. Uh, within SUNY, we're kind of like a, a confederacy and so our, 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 um, our institutions all act um, essentially as their own uh, institution. And, and though there are some, certain SUNY mandates that uh, govern those institutions, for the most part, they can govern themselves. Um, so some campuses have gone through the process of putting OER into promotion and tenure um, requirements. Or, or acknowledging the acceptance of OER as a worthwhile academic pursuit for faculty. Um, and then others have uh, stressed the need to pursue OER uh, to tackle textbook affordability. And then, you know, the, the discussion point that Nita brought up is exactly what we're wrestling with right now. Uh, and what Billy responded to is you, we have some campuses that really think that this is affordability issue and that you know, we should tackle uh, student affordability with OER, and there's, there's, I don't think anybody would argue against that. Um, but we now have some faculty, you know, speaking up to say OER is more than just about affordability. Um, and, you know, we're, we're in a unique spot where, you know, we think we can do some really decent analysis on the data that we're getting from campuses. Um, so that we can show what impact OER is, is really having on our, on our classes and especially our faculty because our faculty are stating that it's really kind of helping them to customize the learning experience for students that they traditionally could not do with, you know, commercial published textbooks. And I'm assuming everybody on the call is probably nodding their head, right? <laughs> yes, behind all the, the, turned off cameras, we can imagine many heads are nodding. Thanks for um, chiming in, Mark, really appreciate it. And um, Anita had actually the same question I, I did listening to you, which is, um, do you know if any of the four years in the SUNY system have addressed tenure and promotion, or can you think of any campuses specifically that maybe we could take a look at what they've done? So um, one four-year institution, uh, SUNY Delhi. Um, it, it's just a line inside uh, the promotion and tenure requirements that comes out of their academic affairs office. Um, it's just kind of like an umbrella statement that OER should be considered, um, you know, a viable um, method for teaching and for scholarship. And I can, uh, I can share that link with the community. I wish I had it at my fingertips. Super, thanks.
And Jennifer's asking if you have a SUNY system OER policy. Um, no, we don't. We just passed an open access policy at the system level, which means all our uh, state operated campuses, because we're a combination of state operated campuses and county controlled uh, campuses, our county controlled operations or our campuses or what we call community colleges in the states. Um, the, uh, the state ops have to put a, uh, an OER policy on their books um, by March 2020. Um, so we have the open access policy and, and maybe one day that'll lead to a, an OER policy. We, we kind of hope so. Nod, nod, more nodding. All right, um, we are closing in on the hour. We've got about four minutes left. So if there are any last thoughts or questions anyone would like to try and fit in before we go, I think we also got a lot of ideas for um, future office hour topics like on course markings, for example, uh, perhaps revisiting tenure and promotion, um, and maybe hearing more from our SUNY guests and sort of thinking about the statewide um, OER process. So anything? Okay, I think we're, we're in a good spot here. I think we're in our wrap up spot. I see heads nodding, thank you. All right, so please join me in thanking our three guests and everyone else who chimed in today. We um, invited Billy Meinke, Jessica Norman, and Michelle Braley. And uh, we so appreciate hearing your stories, the ups and downs, and uh, where you think uh, you may be going at your institutions. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us and asking your questions, sharing your resources, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Um, in our February office hours.